Hello, everybody. At the point when Frankie Beverly, lead vocalist of the spirit band Labyrinth, died this week, I thought about the crowd on his accounts from one November night in 1980 at Sanger Theatre. His collection, Live in New Orleans, caught in excess of a show. It caught a defining moment ever. President Carter had lost his reappointment bid scarcely seven days sooner. Beverly was recording, and Carter received votes from nearly 60% of Orleans Parish. The gross domestic product grew a staggering 4.6% during Carter's just term. However, expansion was 13%, similar to the destitution rate. His adversary, Ronald Reagan, faulted social projects and government assistance beneficiaries for the monetary misfortunes. At the point when Reagan first workshopped that manner of speaking, in his 1966 mission for legislative head of California, the battle on destitution had recently started. In 1965, black America had a poverty rate of more than 40%, while the overall rate was 17%. Reagan and his party had a long history of disliking the war on poverty and the people it was meant to help by 1980. In his first two years, he eliminated more than $22 billion from social programs. What's more, when Reagan went out, the area's neediness rate was back up to its most noteworthy since, sit tight for it, 1965. Now that I'm listening, I realize that Beverly's 1980 performance in New Orleans of We'll Get Through These Changing Times was about all of this and the road ahead. His music was both the fleeting tranquility before all hell breaks loose and the device expected to discover a lasting sense of harmony in it. That is the reason, Bliss and Torment, the fourth track on the live collection, sounds less like a R&B show and more like a restoration. He begins, Sometimes we go through life and things don't always work out the way you want them to. As you become older, you sort of figure out how to live with the delights and agony of life. You all... Could I at any point get an observer to that? As a youngster, I assumed I comprehended what Beverly was referring to in Bliss and Torment. After that, you get older, Beverly said. Also, with savvier eyes, you are more ready to see exactly the way that excruciating it must have been for guardians to not have the option to take care of their kids or keep the lights on. When Live in New Orleans was delivered in 1981, almost one of every seven Americans had dove into destitution. Break was showing up in significant urban communities, and the U.S. separate from rate was at its pinnacle. Similar to how Bruce Springsteen and John Mellencamp became voices for the white working class in the same era, Beverly's music lifted the spirits of the black community. Beverly talks about a time when someone asked him why he chose New Orleans to record a live album at one point in the recording. His response was wonderful in its straightforwardness. Indeed, why not, you dig? Through the long focal point of time, we can now see Beverly's decision of city was the ideal scenery. After oppression came the New Orleans slaughter of 1866, the race mob of 1900 and other fear-based oppressor, goes after that left endless dead and annihilated dark organizations and homes. At the point when development of Sayanga started in 1924, there was success in New Orleans, yet Jim Crow regulations kept individuals of color disappointed. And afterward, only two months after the theater opened, the incomparable Mississippi surge of 1927 crushed the district, causing more than $1 billion in penalties equivalent to 33% of the government spending plan at that point. The flood killed in excess of 1,000 individuals and dislodged 700,000 others. A considerable lot of the casualties were relatives of the subjugated who had been constrained into sharecropping. About a mile from Sayanga is the eatery where social liberties figures like Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther Lord Jr. would supplicate and eat as they met with neighborhood pioneers planning on the best way to destroy harsh regulations. This rich and finished history, each defining moment, all added to the forming of the New Orleans People Group and is reflected in the crowd voice 
heard on that 1980 recording. The hits were laid out before Sanger. What made the collection groundbreaking was affirmation of a common encounter and shared versatility communicated by the individuals who joined in. When Before I Let Go debuted in the summer, the death of Ernest R. Lacey sparked months of protest Lacey, in Milwaukee. A 22 year old black man decided to walk to a store for food. He was helping his cousin paint his apartment. Police defied him, guaranteeing he fit the depiction of an assault suspect. Fancy kicked the bucket while in their guardianship. The one who had been assaulted later recognized her aggressor and he was indicted. Frilly was blameless. During times in which it was more straightforward to yield to despise and surrender, Beverly supported for adoration and resolve. With a line of immortal works of art that can be heard at any barbecue worth battling 405 traffic to get to. A relieving demulcent, brimming with insight and warmth. Labyrinth shows were part family get-together, part local area treatment. Both BET and the NAACP presented Beverly with awards for lifetime achievement. His profession extended across times, his voice prompted nine gold records, and his music impacted ages. However, to the disgrace of the recording foundation, he never got a Grammy. The Grammys may as yet address that oversight and honour Beverly as he ought to be. Since it wasn't ability that restricted Beverly's range, it was the business. Individuals of colour had made the blues well before Mamie Smith strolled into the studio in 1920 to record what's viewed as the principal blues record. The outcome of Smith's recording prompted race records, which prompted Bulletin having a rundown of the most well-known records in Harlem during the 1940s. Motown was overlooked during grant season for quite a long time. By 1985, the American music grants had arrived on a most-loved dark single class as a method for keeping everybody cheerful. It was a large number of many years of attempting to contain something as natural as music, such as driving a one-celled critter to hold a shape. Early this year, when Tracy Chapman made that big appearance with Luke Brushes and together, with the assistance of a tale about destitution in America, they reminded us generally that music was never intended to keep us separated. It's there to keep us intact. Beverly knew that better than anyone else. Gratitude for observing.